Welcome to Next Round with the Pacific Research Institute. I'm your host, Romina Itchum. In this podcast, our guest is Tim Rice, Deputy Director of Health Policy at the Manhattan Institute in New York City. New York and California have something in common. State governments at once single payer. The Manhattan Institute recently released a study on New York's proposed single payer plan and its impact on the state's hospitals. Tim and I, PRI's Director of Communications, and I chat with Tim Rice about this new study and whether California might see the same results if it passed its own single payer plan. We also discuss with Tim Rice President Trump's new drug initiative, its drawbacks, as well as the future of Obamacare. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to Next Round with PRI, Tim. Thank you for having me. California and New York have two big things in common, a state government that wants single payer and a government that can actually make it happen thanks to one party rule in our respective state capitals. In New York, your plan is called the New York Health Act. Talk about what that system looks like and do you think New York politicians will actually pass it? Yeah, so the New York Health Act has passed the New York State Assembly five separate times since it was first introduced in 1992, but it's always been defeated in the Senate, usually by a a one vote uh, holdout. So Democrats in the most recent midterm elections took control, as you said, of the governor's mansion and majorities in both houses of the legislature for the first time since 2012 and only the second time ever since 1932. So this means that the New York Health Act could finally pass the Senate. I don't think that will be signed into law. Uh, I don't think that because Governor Cuomo has is on the record saying that he thinks he's in favor of single payer health care, but he thinks that it should be it, sh- it should be done at a federal level, which is a, a, a clever way of avoiding uncom- uncomfortable conversations about single payer in the state, while also establishing his progressive credentials for a potential 2020 presidential bid. So I think that even in the likely event that it winds up passing the Assembly and the Senate, I don't think it'll make it out of the governor's mansion. California is kind of in a similar boat. We have a single payer proposal that was kicked around last session. It was Senate Bill 560 and the nonpartisan legislative analyst projected it would cost about $400 billion, which would be double the budget of the entire state. And you've seen that politicians who are in favor of single payer have been pretty vague about how to fund the program. So uh, since we don't really have any ideas how it would be funded in California, maybe New York has some ideas. So what are politicians talking about there as how they would fund their single payer? scheme there. You know, pe- politicians in New York are unsurprisingly perhaps um, being as vague as politicians in California. So I am actually not aware of any estimate that are being touted proudly or openly by politicians say that everyone agrees that it will come from an increase in tax revenue, obviously. And the most generous assessment that I've seen is that it will require $91 billion in taxes. The, the least generous assessment, I suppose, is that it will require an additional $226 billion in taxes. Uh, each of those estimates are by 2019, assuming the bill was signed into law this year. Uh, and the number that's tossed around the most often, however, comes from a, a RAND Corporation study, which was pretty sympathetic to the bill, which estimates that the New York Health Act will require $139 billion in extra taxes by 2022, and then it, the cost of taxpayers will then rise to $210 billion by 2031. So pretty ambiguous. None of it is good, and, and either way, it's going to be more taxes for New Yorkers. The Manhattan Institute published a, a recent study on the impact of single payer on New York's hospitals. Tell us about this study and can you see the same thing happening in in California? Absolutely. The study which we wrote in partnership with the Empire Center, um, a think tank up in in Albany, up in our state capital, really takes as its starting point the ambiguity that we just discussed. So we looked at a couple of reimbursement models that we can reasonably assume might be used under the New York Health Act. So the the main one we looked at is the, the type of reimbursement structure proposed in the Medicare for All that Bernie Sanders has proposed at a federal level. So under this model, you basically would take so the average amount Medicare reimburses hospitals now and buy it to all hospitals, bringing everyone to that number. So if we took Bernie's model, 77% of hospitals in New York would lose money. Four in 10 would face revenue cuts of 15% or more, which would put them at risk of closure. The other model we looked at involves possibly setting reimbursement at 20% above current Medicare rates. So what that would do is it would keep aggregate hospital spending the same 
across the state. But even still, you'd see a decent amount of hospitals would lose money. A decent amount of hospitals would be uh, at risk of closure. And more importantly, with that one, that would mean a much steeper tax increase down the line. The other big thing that the, the report found is that some of New York's best hospitals would be hardest hit. So just a couple of big examples. NYU Langone would lose 43 percent of its revenues. Loan Kettering would lose 18 percent. New York Presbyterian would lose 16 percent. And Mount Sinai would lose 13 percent. These are the crown jewels of New York's hospital system, right? And the fact that they would make money makes sense because at the end of the day, this bill, like all single payer bills, is redistributed. So New York, just like California, has a decent amount of variability between its best and its worst hospital. So what we want policymakers to do is try to find ways to improve the worst hospital, bring those, those, the hospitals at the bottom of the barrel up. But what these bills would do is it would drag everyone into the middle. So maybe it, it, would, it would increase the funding or the potential of some of these bad hospitals, but it would really drag down the hospital that not, are not only the best hospitals in New York or California, but some of the best hospitals in the country. And I don't think anyone wants that. That's just stunning to hear that about, even in California, we know those three hospitals there. Those are like some of the best, most prominent hospitals in the country. I'm sure many Californians who have certain you know, rare issues may travel to New York for medical tourism to attend those hospitals. So what, what's your proposal or solution for improve the health care provided by some of the lower income hospitals? Well, it's certainly not, again, uh, through redistribution of funds. I think that there are a number of things that, that you can do, and it requires looking at each hospital on an individual basis. So hospital payment um, is, is one thing. Uh, reforming hospital payment would certainly help. The one issue that, that uh, we feel keenly here in New York, and I would imagine is pretty similar in, in California, is the recent trend of hospital consolidation. So over the past decade, and spurred on by the Affordable Care Act, hospitals have been incentivized to merge into these mega uh, hospitals, these hospital monopolies, where, you know, the idea originally was that these hospitals would, since they could channel resources and concentrate resources with one big administrative bureaucracy, they'd be able to cut costs and improve outcomes. We've actually found that uh, it's the opposite true. So uh, the Manhattan Institute released a study back in 2016 that looked at hospital consolidation in New York and found that consolidation kept costs up and reduced outcomes. So outcomes were worse and, and prices were higher, the exact opposite of what was supposed to happen. For a while, while this was a, a point that was pretty much confined to conservative right of policy or right of care policy analysts, because you know competition is, is, is something that we look for in the solution. But recently, everyone is sort of coming around to this. A few weeks ago, the New York Times released an analysis that looked at hospitals across the country and found basically what we found a couple of years ago looking at New York, which is that hospital consolidation, anti-competitive regulations in the hospital base keep costs up and outcomes down. So I think that one thing we could do to really improve these hospitals is to roll back some of these regulations, roll back the regulations that put states in control of when you can and can't build new hospital wings or, or what facilities you can and can't build, uh, discourage hospital mergers, encourage physician ownership of practices, all these things that, that we've, we've taken the opposite track on over the past 10 years or so. If we reverse that course, if we re-inject competition. Let's talk about another uh, big issue related to health care that's been in the news a lot lately, and that's the cost of prescription drugs. Uh, right before the midterm elections, President Trump proposed a plan that the administration says would bring down the cost of prescription drugs. You wrote in an op-ed that if Republicans and Democrats work together to come after drug companies on this issue, that actually would be bad news for patients. So what's the problem with this proposal? Right. So that proposal that I was writing about is problematic because what it attempts to do is to tie what Medicare pays for certain drugs to the governments of other countries. Pay. So at the moment, other countries pay way less for a lot of drugs than American patients and Medicare and the American government. This is because these countries have single payer systems themselves. And when uh, an American pharmaceutical company is selling drugs to the United Kingdom, say they're not selling drugs to various insurers or hospitals in the United Kingdom, they're selling drugs to the United Kingdom. So these countries in Europe and elsewhere can pretty much tell our, our companies what they want to pay. And that's the price. So at the moment, American patients, either through private insurance or public insurance pay more than citizens of other countries. So what this proposal, which was going to affect Medicare Part B, would have done would be to tie what Medicare pays to an index of what other countries pay. Uh, unfortunately, it wouldn't work because there's no way of enforcing what other countries would pay. It opens the door to some serious cuts to underlying pharmaceutical profits. But on a broader level, what I, what I meant is, was this. Democrats are now pretty much unilaterally in favor of things like price controls, profit ceilings, and essentially letting the government control how pharmaceutical companies make and spend money. Now, developing new drugs is extremely expensive. 
It costs around $2.6 billion to make a new drug. And all of these proposals would cut into that bottom line and cripple future innovation. Now, I don't think Republicans will ever totally sell Democrats on free market reforms for drug prices. But if what we're coming to the negotiating table with looks pretty much like the reforms that they're coming to the table with, we're going to leave those negotiations with reforms that look like Democratic policy reforms. We can try to fight to some sort of middle ground, but only if we come with our best reforms in hand and not basically start capitulating to these price controls before we even start negotiations. Now, another aspect of that uh, proposal requires drug companies to post prices of drugs in their ads. Now, normally as free marketeers, we like transparency and we like to see the price of things now. What's wrong with, with that idea? Yeah, so that regulation, exactly as you said, it, at, at first it seems like good sort of pro-transparency measure, but the issue is that the prices it required the companies to post were the list prices. So, you know, put simply, these list prices are the very beginning, up there at the very beginning of a long process, that uh, a long process of setting pharmaceutical prices. So the list price is an initial calculation put out by the drug company, which through a series of rebates and kickbacks and discounts and wholesaling and distribution magic will not be the price that the patient actually pays. So no patient really pays the list price. Uh, in most cases, patients pay much less than the list price. So in a certain sense, it's a good, in a certain sense, the list price is relevant because the price that a patient ultimately pays is in fact based on the list price, but it's so far off. It's sort of like buying a dress at an outlet mall that's on a 98% discount, right? You know, it, yes, in some sense that original price matters, but, but it doesn't really matter to you. You only care what's on the price tag that you're holding in your hand, not what it was a year ago when it was 98% more expensive. So these aren't really, this isn't information that patients can really use. If anything, it might deter them from seeking care because they might see a commercial while watching a baseball game and think, oh, I have that condition. I could use that drug. Oh, that drug is going to cost $15,000. I'm not even going to consider it. Well, it might not cost $15,000. For that patient, it might cost $100 a month or $200 a month, something much more managed. You know, there's also the possibility that it might cost that much money for that patient. But the alternative might be a condition that's even more expensive that requires a lot of time and hospital and expensive surgery. So ultimately, the list price is not the kind of thing that we should be focusing on. And if we, if with this regulation and regulations like it, if we put list prices in the public eye, if we make people concerned about list prices, it's going to reorient our discussion about drug price reform to a, to a place we don't want it to be. This is not a, no productive reform for drug prices will come out of a conversation about list prices. So let's turn to the insurance market. Market. You know, the Obamacare enrollment period has just ended in the states, and for the first time, average premiums for the benchmark silver plans are not going to increase. In fact, they're slated to decline by 1.5%. But in California, we're seeing a 9% increase. So why are premiums dropping nationally but not in California? And what's New York's experience with premiums? So I'm not sure why premiums are rising in California. I will say, or I should note that 20 states, 20 states saw premiums go up. So the net effect nationally was the premiums would decrease. But, you know, we did see mostly single digit premium in case, uh, increases in 20 states across the country, including New York. The reason we saw a lot of reductions in premiums as well is because last year insurers raised their premiums by an egregious amount because they were convinced that once the Trump administration repealed the individual mandate, it would just throw the market get into utter chaos, everything would collapse, they would lose a ton of money. So they wanted to raise premiums last year to insulate themselves from what they thought was going to happen this year or after the mandate was repealed. Of course, the mandate was repealed, nothing happened, the market did not collapse, they realized that they overreacted, and this year they've adjusted by lowering premiums. Now, overreaction is not necessarily a bad thing. This market, the Obamacare market, is relatively new. The insurers had to figure out how to navigate it. That's why we saw premium increases for most of the first couple of years when they didn't know who was going to enroll, how sick they were going to get, how subsidies were going to work. These are all reasonable things to be unsure about, and they are quite literally insuring against future risk. So what we're seeing now is that as the sixth open enrollment period comes to an end, we're seeing, or the fifth open enrollment period, we're seeing the, the nation's insurers have figured out how to act and how to behave in the Obamacare market.
market. Things are hitting an equilibrium. Things are evening out. So for California, I would imagine it's just a matter of your particular individual market. Maybe you'll see premiums decrease next year. 9% isn't, isn't too terrible. But I will say that in New York, we saw premiums increase by 8.6%. But insurers requested an increase of 24%. And the reason for this is there's a law in New York that allows the governor essentially to adjust, approve, or reject any proposed increases for the individual market. So what Governor Cuomo has done is each year, he has artificially suppressed what the insurers had request for increase. So at first, this didn't make any sense. Again, as I said, these insurers were requesting increases of 5 6 7% to insulate against unknown market changes in a new market. So while every other state in the country was uh, approving these increases and allowing the insurers to get their bearings, New York was suppressing them. So at first, we saw actual premiums going up modestly, and we saw insurer requests going up modestly. But in the past couple of years, while premiums still go up modestly, insurer requests are, are increasing pretty rapidly to the point where, again, the difference is between almost 9% and 24%, what they got and what they actually want. So the governor has basically put New York in this artificial boom-bust cycle where every year the, the, insurer, the New York's insurers have not, were not able to insure against the risk that they were incurring or the losses that they were going to take. They still need to make that money back. So each year that the government, the governor does this, not only are New Yorkers not going to see premium reductions like in the rest of the country, but this bubble is going to get bigger and bigger until for some reason down the line it may pop. And then when it does, all of a sudden New Yorkers are going to see premiums increase 30, 40 percent at a time in the absolute worst case scenario. Now, both New York and California have outlawed short term health insurance plans. How will this impact the price of health insurance and access to health care <clears throat> in our state? The impact on overall insurance prices will likely be minimal. The Congressional Budget Office found that expanding short term plans would only raise ACA premiums, Obamacare premiums, by something like around 6 percent. So I would imagine that an outright ban of them might make things a little bit cheaper at the margins of the individual market, but not not anything to write home about, not anything that makes a real difference. In terms of the availability of affordable plans, New York and California have made a terrible decision because these plans are cheaper and smarter and many oftentimes much better fits for a lot of people than plans they could get through Obamacare. A quick example, uh, and I'll use Oklahoma as an example because neither of our home states have short-term insurance plans. Hold on. Uh, a 27-year-old non-smoker in Tulsa, Oklahoma could get a benchmark silver plan. This is the, the plan that Obamacare uses as an average price, second lowest cost silver plan. Uh, you get a benchmark silver plan with a $3,250 deductible for $430 a month. Alternatively, that same person could get a short-term plan with a $2,500 deductible for $80 a month. So they can get a cheaper and more generous option for a plan that, again, for a healthy young man, probably fits his needs. Now, in New York, they're stuck with Obamacare if they need to be on the individual market. There's no short-term insurance. And for a, a plan with a similar deductible, they would have to pay $566 a month. So they do not have that choice. They don't have the option to opt for an $80 a month plan. I haven't pulled the numbers for California, but I would imagine it's the same thing. So New York, California, and other blue states that have banned short-term plans have proven that they're putting politics over people. What they've shown is, despite the fact that they say that they're interested in providing affordable insurance for all people, they're really not. They're interested in providing what the Democratic Party has decided is the only viable option for affordable insurance to, insurance to everyone. They're not interested in making sure everyone has cheap plans to meet their needs. They're making sure that Obamacare lives out the decade and is the law of the land in the future. So th this is this is a purely political calculation, and I hope that, that New York and California and, and other states, New Jersey, Jersey, other states that have followed their lead will, will reconsider and make these plans available. One thing that despite a lot of talk that hasn't happened during the first two years of the Trump administration has been Congress acting to repeal Obamacare. Now that, you know, the political dynamic in Congress is going to change significantly af after the holidays, do you think that Obamacare is here to stay? And realistically, is there anything that a divided Congress can agree about? upon to improve it if it can't ultimately act to repeal it. I do think it's here to stay. Um, I, I think it's been here to stay for a while. And so I don't think there's anything that a, a divided Congress can do to repeal it. And as we saw over the past two years, there was really nothing that a, a united Congress could do to repeal it. I'm obviously no fan of Obamacare, but the fact of the matter is a lot of Americans like it. More and more Americans like it every year, even Americans that opposed it to begin with. Americans like free stuff. Americans like free health care. Everyone likes free health care. It's really hard to take entitlement programs away from people once they've started benefiting from it. And there's no doubt that many Americans have benefited from Obamacare. 
Obamacare or more likely from the Medicaid expansion that has gone on under Obamacare. That doesn't mean Obamacare is perfect. That doesn't mean that we should turn turn the other cheek and ignore Obamacare's problems. That doesn't mean that we should uphold Obamacare at the expense of other alternatives like short-term plans. So I do think there are some things that Congress can do to improve it and that the administration has already done to improve it. I think repealing the individual mandate was a tremendous relief to a lot of Americans. The individual mandate was a tax. It was a poorly designed tax, unnecessary and unfair. It, it targeted primarily people coming from households that made less than $50,000 a year. So it was really a tax on the poor. And it didn't, there's, there's no proof that it, 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 it improved health outcomes nationwide. So by repealing that tax, the administration has taken a burden off the shoulders of some of the Americans that were being hit hardest by it and restored a, a pretty basic freedom, which is the freedom to choose to be uninsured if you want to choose to be uninsured. On the other hand, by expanding alternatives like the short-term plans and association health plans, the administration has provided to those people who no longer have to get Obamacare plans smart, cheap alternatives. On a broader level, last week, the administration unveiled a regulation that would expand the potential uses of uh, so-called 1332 waivers. They're called state innovation waivers, named after Section 1332 of the Affordable Care Act. This is a provision that was in the original law that allows states to eliminate or tamper with many of the requirements of the Affordable Care Act. They can institute high-risk pools. They can create reinsurance funds. They can basically redesign the ACA at a state level in order to serve the needs of their constituents. This provision didn't go into effect in 2017, right at the beginning of the Trump administration. At first, President Trump and the administration seemed to shy away from it. This was when they were really still seemed focused on repealing the Affordable Care Act. They did not want to do anything to shore it up or to make it seem like a viable alternative. Fortunately, it seems like the administration is changing their tune. It seems like they have now decided that since they can't repeal Obamacare, we should just make it as good as possible. So that's going to be something that we should all keep an eye on. I think that there's a lot of promise in that regulation. And it could. I think that Obamacare could be made to work for a lot of people if the states are given the flexibility to tinker with it as they see fit. So, Tim, for our last and favorite question, it's, it's our tradition at Next Round to ask each guest for a wine, beer, or a cocktail recommendation. So we're going into the holidays. We're going into a new Congress. What do you like to drink these days to uh, celebrate and, and fortify yourself for the new uh, new political season? <laughs> well, I'll give you two answers. For the holidays, definitely a hot toddy. Big fan of hot toddies, you know, with a, a sort of heavier whiskey to, to hot water recipe. Uh, I'll, I'll give a suggestion to all your listeners if you can track it down. Last year for Christmas, somebody gave me a bottle of, it's called Mike's Hot Honey. It's a spicy honey, which uh, is great on a lot of things, but you add it to a hot toddy and it really gives it a nice extra kick and a little bit of heat. Um, and of course, the holidays beyond, and especially when dealing with a new Congress, uh, a good old fashioned glass of bourbon always does the trick. Thanks so much, Tim. Thanks for having me. Thanks again to Tim Rice. You can find Tim Rice's research at manhattaninstitute.org. You can also follow him on Twitter at Tim E. Rice One. If you're in the Orange County, California area, mark your calendars for Wednesday, January 16th for a luncheon with Heather McDonald of the Manhattan Institute. Heather will discuss her new book, The Diversity Delusion, How Race and Gender Pandering Corrupt the University and Undermine Our Culture. Details are on our website at pacificresearch.org. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or TuneIn. And please do us a favor and give us five stars. You can also listen to our podcast on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash pacificresearch1. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. We hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.